Hello everyone, it's Wednesday, March 8th. I'm David Song, Currency Analyst with Daily FX. Uh, here for just a quick preview on the European Central Bank interest rate decision scheduled for tomorrow morning and of course the highly anticipated U.S. Non-Farm Appeals Report on tap for Friday. So uh, we'll go over those market expectations. We'll talk about again some of the sort of rhetoric we can anticipate from the Governing Council. We'll watch non-farm payroll expectations. We'll see, um, again, how this will potentially play out for not only uh, the FX market, but it may have a meaningful impact, especially for the Fed rate decision next week. As uh, Chair Janet Yellen, of course, argued that um, could see a March rate hike as long as the economy stays on course. So we'll see if, again, uh, those numbers out of the U.S. Um, labor market will really influence price action, market expectations ahead of the Federal Reserve next week. So with that, let's start off with the, you know, just your dollar here and I'll bring up, you know, sort of the docket and what's happening and uh, right now your dollar, I was a little bit more excited about the pair last week when we saw it dabble at support, you know, back at this 10470, 105 handle last week, but you know, we really saw that failed to move to the downside. We got that pop on Friday. You know, even though, again, we got those comments from Chair Janet Yellen really endorsing uh, speculation for March rate hike. So we got that quick pop, closed above that 106 handle. Uh, but ever since then, we've been largely tracking lower, carving out this you know, sort of near-term series of lower highs and lower lows. Uh, so the way I look at it right now, guys, I think we're still capped right around that 106.60, 106.80 zone here. So you know, I'm looking for a little bit more clarity, maybe a potential break of this range here. But for now, you know, I, I think the big question is, what will the European Central Bank lay out tomorrow, right? So you know, let me start off by saying, you know, there's a few things I think markets will watch next week is um, how will the ECB steer us as they plan to reduce right, their asset purchase program to 60 billion euros a month starting in April. So again, you know, maybe we'll get a little bit more uh, clarity on whether or not that will continue to be the case, right? Will they continue to taper? reduce their non-standard measures going forward, especially over the course of 2017. Uh, but for now, you know, there is one statement I think that we need to keep a close eye on. And, you know, I'll bring up the monetary policy um, review, if you will, or the account, the minutes of the last meeting. And uh, a quick thing you could do as well, and, you know, there's a few dynamics I want to look at before we go in. And, you know, here's one of the kickers, and I think this is not only Maybe something we need to watch for the ECB, but for the Federal Reserve. I think the Reserve Bank of Australia also, you know, sort of mentioned this in their statement yesterday. So, you know, I'm watching this theme about energy, right? and, and you just, could just do a quick search on uh, some of these policy statements. And where is that um, convincing sort of statement, right? So, uh, it first turns out here, and again, this is the policy meeting minutes from the last ECB rate decision in December. Um, but again, they noted, turn to prices, annual euro, uh, euro area HICP inflation has risen, right, 1.1% in December, up from 0 0.6, mainly reflecting substantial stronger energy inflation, right? So again, even though we're seeing that headline at 2%, if you guys watch that core rate of inflation for the Eurozone, it's in staying steady at that 0.9% clip, so it's still well below that 2% you know, target for inflation, and as I mentioned, you know, with the RBA, right? Headline inflation rates have moved higher in most countries, partly reflecting the higher commodity prices. Right? So is that something that we'll hear from the ECB tomorrow? Right? Follow along with the RBA, and you know what? Let's add Chair Jenny Yellen in there too. You know, I always look through these monetary policy reports, and yeah, same story here. You do a quick search of energy. Right? Inflation moved up over the past year, and again, this was the testimony we had from Chair Jenny Yellen in front of Congress. Right? But she also noted inflation moved up over the past year mainly because of diminishing effects of the earlier declines in energy prices and import prices, right? So again, are we going to see this, you know, hawkish tone, you know, is the Fed going to argue, you know, keep up their argument, I would say, that they're not behind the curve? I think that will certainly be the case, and, you know, more so for the ECB tomorrow, you know, will they blame the uptick in that headline inflation, the 2.0% clip on, again, higher energy prices or the recovery that we saw in energy and will they continue to you know really cast a very dovish outlook for monetary policy and if you guys have been you know looking at some of the bank research I'll throw some names out there um, certainly some of the word on the street if you will that I've been seeing you know there's a lot of back and forth on when the ECB 
you know, will really remove their easing cycle. And, you know, I don't think anyone's expecting the ECB to raise their rates until at least 2019. So that's actually, you know, from some of the big bank research that I've been watching. Um, but again, I think most of these big banks are looking for the ECB not only to retain this very accommodative policy stance throughout this year, but also next year. And in the sort of speculation that I'm seeing at the moment right now, market chatter, if you will, is that the ECB probably won't be ready to raise their benchmark interest rate out of, again, that minus 0.4% deposit rate, at least until 2019. Uh, so with that said, broader outlook, I think, will continue to be shifted to the downside, as, of course, Fed expectations you know, remain um, well anchored, let me say it that way. So. You know, before we move on with the discussion, just to give you guys a quick update. You know, I throw this site out many, many times, and I'm glad that CME actually put this together for, you know, especially retail traders like us. But you know, watch the projections for me. They're they're very really skewed. Greater than 90% probability that they will raise rates next week, right? So where will that leave the your, your dollar here? And um, you know, I'll cover more of this next week. I'll be doing the same webinar again just ahead of the Fed next week, but my big concern is what's going to happen with the interest rate dot plot. Uh, we'll talk more about that as Fed officials have been trimming again the longer run forecast for Fed funds. But again, it looks as though that March rate hike is there. We'll see if that will give some downside risk to the euro dollar here, but um, again, right now I talked about it this morning in my report, guys, but you know, euro dollar here, it's, I would say, clouded at the best, and personally on my end, you know, even though it looks pretty constructive, we broke out out of some of these bearish formations here. You know, my sort of concern is, you know, will the ECB really want to, you know, change its tune for monetary policy um, and really undermine some of the efforts that have taken to really support the monetary union there. So, again, I think the passive least resistance for the ECB is to retain their dovish tone, stay accommodative, and again, we'll see if this was, in fact, a false move, maybe a false run here at a former support zone. Right, that 10660, 10680. So I'm flat for now, but again, given the sort of fake out that we had, I guess, coming into the first full week of March, right, I'm taking this as a failed move at resistance. Maybe we'll watch the bottom of support here, but you know, I'm waiting for a little bit more clarity, especially once we get through the ECB, or hopefully once we get through the ECB, and maybe even after U.S. non-farm payroll. So you know, if you guys are watching, um, again, some of the other pairs that I like watching a little bit more so especially versus the European block. And you know, one thing I just want to mention here about um, Euro before we move on is, um, you know, March 15th is the Fed day, but don't forget that's also when we have the Dutch elections going on. So, you know, I, I'm not sure if I would really want to touch your dollar next week, um, not only, again, during the Federal Reserve, but as we have the Dutch elections going on, um, same time, same day, again, as the Federal Reserve quarterly rate decision. So a lot of members for the Euro next week. And, you know, we've got this updated budget from the UK, and I just want to cover Sterling real quickly here because, you know, I think we're approaching a very key level right now. Uh, it's that 121 hurdle, right? So, again, we sort of gapped lower here earlier in the year, uh, but for now, I'm still watching that 121 hurdle where even after the British pound flash crash move right back in October, we just really failed to close below that region, right? So, again, I'll take that sort of gap lower that we had, right, in January with the grain of salt, so as we're approaching that level, you know, that's the one dynamic that I'm looking to see whether or not we'll continue to see the fail. But, you know, the R side is giving me a pretty nice signal here that we fail to retain that sort of recovery stage in the momentum indicator. And we got that nice bearish tilt. The one sort of test that I'm looking for at the moment right now is to see whether or not we can break into oversold territory, right? So, again, the last time, just take it with, you know, for what it's worth, guys, the last time we had that oversold reading was back in October. And, again, it coincided with that bearish pound flash crash move. I'm not saying we're going to see another flash crash here. That's definitely not what I'm saying. Um, but again, once we get these moves below 30 on the RSI, I mean, contrary to some beliefs, we actually see I mean, the exchange rate move lower. And you know what? The reason why I want to bring up all this is because there's one pair that's showing that, and it's actually the Kiwi dollar. Right? Um, just be mindful of what's happening here. We're actually breaking to fresh monthly lows, and I do like the move. Um, to be quite honest, I was playing this, was dabbling at it, <laughs> coming into March, and um, I got stopped out in profit, and I missed this entire ride to the downside. So I've been waiting for some better uh, levels to get back in, but I just haven't been able to uh, get my hands back in on this move. And uh, we're again pressing fresh monthly lows. It looks as though we might be on our way to testing in those late December lows as well. So now that we've cleared 69.50, I want to see if we're going to get another day of closing price below that. But again, as I was mentioning with the Sterling case here, it's the RSI that really speaks to me, right? And and here's an example or the sort of theme that I want to bring up is 
we got that oversold reading. And I talked about this when it was Friday, Monday. It was one of my last reports, but again, even though we get lower to start the week, our site continues to push into oversold, losses continue. Um, and again, until we get that at least textbook definition, right, the RSI pushing back above 30, the buy signal, I'll have to watch the downside risk. Right? And again, there's a nice pattern. Right? I'll look for a, a larger pullback, a correction, if you will, once you break out of this near-term bearish formation on the RSI, but this one looks good. And you know what? This also brings me back to the Aussie dollar where, again, we saw that sort of downtick after China posted its first trade deficit in Australia's large trading partner rate right, since 2014. So a nice downward move here, but you know this is the way I'm looking at the move, right? Um, struggling just to get and close back above that 76 hurdle. Right? Uh, very good job, and again, is this playing a bit of a catch up with what's happening in with the Kiwi dollar? Right? They were both in the sort of holding pattern. Right? Uh, during the previous month, we got a meaningful break um, in Aussie coming into March, right? Finally got that break of support, the stubborn range that we were holding. And now we're getting a little bit more conviction to the downside, at least on my end, the fact that we're really struggling to close above, back above 76. So we're holding, again, the 7350 zone right now. Um, the way I look at this, will non-farm payrolls be the big catalyst? And you know what? Uh, I've been having a little bit of back and forth here about what the RBA really said and you know what does this all mean for us? And here's the only thing that I, I wouldn't note about the RBA, and this is my argument about Governor Lowe and company, right? Is, you look at their assessment of the domestic economy, it's really not that good, right? Inflation remains quite low. Again, all their optimism really comes from, again, global economy, right? Noting how, again, China growth is being supported, although this is a bit of concern for them, right? Um, if you look at their domestic sort of take, their stance, right? They're noting inflation is low and they expect underlying inflation to stay low for some time and to be more gradual, the recovery that to be even more gradual than what we're seeing in headline, right? So my account from the RBA is still very dovish. Um, again, we'll see what's going to happen when, you know, with their sort of um, endeavor to balance their books, right? We'll see what's going to happen with the AAA credit rings. Certainly, a lot of concerns about that. But you know, for now, um, I think the RBA is just very comfortable where they are. And you know, the one thing that persists is, of course, the verbal intervention. Right? And appreciating a change would complicate this adjustment here. And you know, here's the one thing that I'm looking at the Aussie dollar, just big picture, guys. Um, Sort of stresses a lot at the last webinar, but you know, just be mindful we're holding that 2016 range, right? So have we really gone anywhere? Eh, not really. We're we're getting back to the top of the range here, but you know, we'll watch the broader outlook in terms of the RBA. Do they have a little bit more room to cut, given again some of their uh, uncertainty? So um, Tonto is asking here. So sell Aussie. I mean, would I sell at the monthly lows? No, definitely not. What I would do, though, my game plan would be Tonto, right? If as we're struggling at 76, so we struggled here, right? That's the way I'm looking at it, right? We we broke above those levels quite some time, right? But we really failed to close above that region. So if we're back up there, maybe I could put a stop. Uh, maybe I could try to get in as close to 76 again. This is just theoretical, right? If I were to looking for a sell trade, I mean, it would be nice if we could get back up there, look for 69 resistance, right to hold, and then maybe sell it from there. That'd be a nice game plan, right? but I mean, selling at the monthly lows, weekly lows, doesn't really make sense to me from here. Right? You know, I, I really, you know, don't like playing um, rebounds, corrections. You know, I'm more of a, I guess, momentum trader. I like to trade trends. Yeah. You know? So for now, again, this is a nice big range to play here. Uh, we've taken one level out or one hurdle out. We're sitting at the next hurdle. Right? But I do again, just want to bring that big picture again that we've really failed to test those 2016 highs right here. So Tonto, is this just a big resistance zone that we approached, stalled, we're getting the nice turn, and can we see a move lower? Right. And again, if the Kiwi is telling us anything from here, right, look at that move. Right, we're almost fully retraced that move from early in this year, the advance. Right. Hope that helps, my friend, right? And last but not least, let's not forget about Dollar Cat, which is also something similar. Look at this move, right? And you know, this is why I kind of like watching the com. Like the euro, the sterling, I feel has been full of disappointment to say the least. Uh, especially for those that were looking for some big moves, right? Like I was, I thought now that we broke out the channel last week, we were gonna get some bigger advances. Uh, a little unfortunate that we're carving uh, lower highs, lower lows in euro dollar. But hey, dollar cad, we're actually clearing a nice level today. So 34.50, 34.60 zone, nice target. 
Um, at least for now, I know we have what, a little bit over four hours until we close them. Um, close, we come to the fix, but it's sitting at the highs for now. Uh, I think we're going to close above this today. Are we going to be trying to make another run right at those uh, late December highs? Right. And again, would I buy here at the monthly highs? No way. And I would probably want to see a pullback. Ideally, I mean, I would like to see 3360, 3370, maybe even, but that's I think maybe a little be a little bit more greedy on my end. Uh, maybe I could watch the weekly lows, right? That would be a, certainly a nice game plan here. But you know, my approach again, we could maybe squeeze higher, but just remember we we have a big resistance zone up here, 3630, 3660 zone where we failed multiple times, right? So I'd be careful on this one. But here's the kicker for me, guys. Is that RSI really pushing into overbought? Right, we're getting that signal with Kiwi, so I do have a little bit of conviction that hey, maybe we can get the stretch a little bit higher, one last kick higher, if you will, to try to test those late December highs, and we'll see if that RSI will give us the conviction. Right, if it continues to push higher with price, great. If it stalls here and we get a turn at 70 and it just really struggles to push into overbought, could again maybe point to some near-term exhaustion, but so far it looks nice. Right. And it looks like the com locks playing along very nicely. And you know what? With that said, let me bring up what's happening with you know gold, silver. I'm, I, you know, I'm sure these are taking a lot of attention. But you know, how does this line up with the whole Fed theme, dollar strength story that's going on right now? But gold has meaningful breaks since the previous week. One of the clear ones to watch. Remember, we talked about that 200-day moving average where we broke above it, but really failed to close above right 1260, uh, right around there. 1261 is 200-day moving average, but nice move lower. Uh, we're bringing a level here too right now, so it brings us really back to this big level again, right? Um, 1198, that's what I have. My colleagues are watching 1200, like Mr. Boutros, right? Uh, Jamie, I'm sure he's watching 1200, but you know, we're going back to that level, right? So if we really move back below that key sort of pivot zone, if you will, is that going to open up the bearish scenario for gold prices again? Right? And when we see again a lot of these bearish calls really becoming apparent, and you know I really like this move because again this is the RSI signature. Look at the conviction we got, right? Even though we've made fresh 2017 highs throughout February, throughout March, I would even argue, right? Or coming into March, right? the RSI really just failed to break into overbought, and I would say this is the the best picture that I have here right, of when we see this disconnect. And why I like using that momentum indicator so much, and why you know it provides some of the conviction that I get with some of these trade setups, right? Let's bring it to gold, uh, silver now. So again, watch 1210. If it close below 1210, 1198, 1200, I think that's going to be a big zone. Which a lot of headlines are going to be surrounding that zone. Uh, but silver, a very oops, wrong security. Silver, very similar dynamic, right? Broke down from the channel. Um, stalled at a big, big zone here. Former support, right? 1860, 1885, if you will, to be exact, right? But that big zone where we spiked again back in November, maybe just a failed run at those highs, broke down from the near term pattern. Um, I, I will argue that I got pretty excited when we broke out of this long term downward trend that we had from last year, but hey, maybe a false break in. Even with this one, we got that conviction, right? Same play as gold, RSI. I mean, even though we were stretching into fresh monthly highs, fresh yearly highs, right throughout the year, that RSI just would not budge, would not break 70, and finally we got that trigger. Right? So Stephen asking here, so what's the moving average on these? So uh, Stephen, I'll give you a good way to read my charts. They're all color coded, right? So the red line, the moving average, will always be the 200 on my charts. Um, the blue one. Um, or the gold one, if you will, yellow one. That's the 100-day moving average. Green is 50. Blue is 20, and then black is 10. Um, and Steve says, awesome, I see that. Oh, cool. Um, and again, I know sometimes it, it really makes my charts look very complicated. But you know, the reason why I like watching these longer term moving averages is because it, it gives me sort of a sense uh, on the bigger term sort of trend, if you will. So you know, I know there's a lot of moving average crossovers people like to play, but that's not why I watch for it. So this is a very good example right now, I guess, Stephen, though, that you just brought my attention to these moving average, but you know when they all clutter up like this, it tells me that we're getting ready for a bigger move, and and that's why I'm getting pretty excited about silver, gold, if you will. That all these moving averages, again, they're cluttered all together, right? Suggesting that again they're tightening up, the range is tightened up. Maybe we could be on a cusp of a larger move, and again, you know, if you just extend out, you know, every time we see them clutter up like this, right? And the last example I have is maybe beginning of last year, right? But when they all come cluttering up like this. 
Okay, they chop, 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 and then we start getting these bullish formations where the faster moving averages will start trading above the slower moving ones, and that's when we get a more dynamic longer term trend to watch. So I'm trying to see if we're going to start breaking that here. And it has already started to turn, so bigger picture on why I have these moving averages on. Hope that helps. Um, but again, unlike gold and silver, just continue on copper. Uh, big test today, right? I, I think we'll finally get a conviction on whether or not copper will follow gold and silver. It's been trying to buck the trend. Right? We've been getting a nice move here, but even with this R side, just doesn't give me too conviction that again we may get this awesome rally going back to the tops and more so maybe we are in for a bit of correction here, a larger correction if you will, as even when we made those highs last month, uh, 2017 highs last month, RSI was nowhere near making those highs. Right? So this is just a very big exhaustion move. I mean, I'll stay constructive for now, but we are finally breaking below this 260 zone. Right? Um, we dabble below it, but I want to see whether or not we're going to finally close below that region today. Right? We've been holding above that I would argue for most of 2017, right, after we got that nice rally to start the year. So threatening a big level, are we getting a little bit more confirmation, if you will, that maybe this will also follow gold and silver? Gives me conviction is gold and silver acting maybe more as commodities now than maybe hedge against currencies. And let me just bring up oil here. Hope you guys are watching this. Copper and silver, big, big sort of developments, I think, today. Uh, we're breaking those trend lines. I'll watch some of the downside targets. Uh, for the, for those of you that are short-term traders, feel free to. You know, I, don't, I don't try to tack on too many short-term retracements. Um, feel free to tack this one on. Right? Um, the 618's not that far. It's 50.25. I'm sure 50 bucks, the very round figure, is going to be you know, very crucial. But that 55 handle has held like a charm. Uh, I guess you can even argue there's like this bearish divergence in the RSI that still persists here. So um, for now. Even though we're getting talks about, again, the adjustment by OPEC and things of that nature, just not sure if oil is going to hold up. Right. So again, gut check at 55, coming into March, utter failure, taking out support now, near-term support I was watching, 52 to 52.40, breaking trend line support, will we open up some of the downside targets? Right. So again, some nice themes to watch, right? Commodity block currency weakness, maybe attributed to commodity price weakness. Uh, here's the one thing I want to throw out. This is where um, still go over this with my colleagues, but what is happening with emerging market currencies? Right? Dollar peso came into a big support zone last week. We're holding it like a charm. Um, so are the stars aligning here, if you will, right? ahead of non-farm peers on Friday, ahead of uh, Federal Reserve next week that you know we might see the dollar outperform, especially against some of these higher beta currencies. Right? Higher uh, or these emerging market currencies, and you know, we'll see if that will largely become the case. Um, dollar Rand, similar story. Let me say it that way. Uh, I think we caught support earlier, but we're getting a nice bounce right now. I want to see if we clear 13, 13, 50 for a little bit more conviction to the top side. But again, emerging market currencies versus the greenback, they're in this sort of consolidation phase. Commodity bought currencies are losing ground, and is this a theme that we need to watch going into? non-farm payrolls. And speaking of non-farm payrolls, um, we're actually looking for some good numbers. So let me take a second here to just break down the numbers for you. And I know there's a lot of numbers that we get for non-farm payrolls. And I know sometimes people stress the labor force uh, participation rate, this and that. But here's the numbers that I'll be personally watching, right? We're looking for, actually, I, I got we got to update this number. I think I saw it at 197 this morning. Um, so ADP came in much stronger than expected. So it's actually spurring upward revisions for non-farm payrolls. Right, so don't worry, guys. We'll fix that on our calendar. Uh, but beyond that, um, again, we're getting some fresh revisions after again the better than expected ADP employment report this morning. But you know, if you look at the metrics right now, we're looking for this downtick in unemployment rate, which could be again positive for the U.S. dollar. Is the U.S. economy approaching full employment? We're looking for this uptick in average hourly earnings, right? And we'll see what's going to happen with that labor force participation rate. Right? Um, as long as it holds steady, it should be all right. Um, but again, these two numbers, you know, we got to watch them in tandem because, you know, sometimes we do see the unemployment rate driven down by discouraged workers leaving the labor force, right? So we'll be keeping a close eye on that. But those are the numbers I'll personally watch again. Un um, not so much unemployment, but headline NFPs, average hourly earnings as we got that unexpected downtick, right, to 2.5%. We'll see if we get a nice recovery. 
and then watch the labor force participation rate as well on Friday. Um, and again, given the recent tone by Chair Jenny Yellen, you know, we'll see if that will really reinforce bets for that March rate hike. But as I mentioned before, guys, they're above 80%. We'll see if non farm payables will, you know, give the dollar a spark maybe before we even jump into the headlines. But one last theme that I just want to cover, i got like three minutes, guys. Um, I'll do my best, but keep a close eye on benchmark equity indices, right? And I was leaving dollar yen off till the, till the end because I want to talk about the Nikkei 225 where it's looking pretty constructive. I, I want to say that. Um, we broke out of this, or, you know, we had this sort of failed attempt. Let me start it that way. Back in February, I thought we could break out of this channel formation. Uh, utter, fail, utter failure, and you know we've been sort of chopping around ever since. But um, nice trend line going on right now. We'll see if we can hold some of these patterns going forward. But I do like the kick higher that we got last week. We tried to make another run at resistance, but we failed. Right, nineteen six thirty six. And so this is a, a security that I've been watching in tandem with the dollar yen. But um, again, are we in for a move higher? If we get rid of the channel, maybe start looking more like an ascending triangle formation. Right? Are we just coiling? Right, to get ready for a pop. And the reason why I, you know, I continue to stress the Nikkei right now, um, because this is the lagger, right? This is the only one that we haven't seen make fresh 2017 highs this month, right? Let me flip over to some of the other ones that I'm watching. And, and that's why, you know, with the Nikkei, I'm really waiting for that closing price above 19,630, 640 zone, if you will, for that conviction. But, you know, let me just run through the others, guys, as I'm quickly running out of time. But, again, earlier this um, beginning of the month, we to start off the month, right? DAX made that fresh really high. Capped, we're pulling back, but I'm still fairly constructive on this one. Maybe this one uh, is the one we need to watch when we into the ECB tomorrow, especially if we do see a very dovish tone from... Uh, present dry hand company, and we'll see if you know they'll, they'll keep that door open to further extend the deadline of these non-standard measures, right? But I'm pretty supportive here. Watch that 20-day moving average; it's been sort of tagging in, bouncing off that. So short term, I'm watching that. But I mean, SPX, what is there to say about this one, right? We've made fresh record highs last week. Uh, certainly, I'm waiting to see whether or not that move with a failure. Remember, we saw this overbought condition for quite some time in the RSI. Uh, so I want to see if this is going to be the real deal, but doesn't look too good. I think we're trying to hold trendline support here, so I need a little bit more clarity, uh, especially in terms of what's going to materialize with risk appetite here. But S&P looks pretty good. Again, themes that I do not want to fight, right? This risk on environment, um, the yen weakness story potential that, that's probably going to come about. And don't forget, next week, March 15th, Fed, the Dutch election, and then hours later, we get the Bank of Japan, right, on the 16th in Asia. With that said, dollar yen, we're coming back up against. So I want to see if we could take out those highs, maybe make a run at those uh, February highs, if you will, January highs. But the hurdle for me is right now around 1510, 1520. Right? Um, we tried to make a run at that last month, failed more meaningful moves at that early in the year, but really just failed to close back above that region. Right? So that's a level that I'm watching right now to see a more meaningful threat of this downward trending channel. Right? But there are some good signs. Right? Like the pickup that we're seeing in risk appetite or the fact that the Nikkei is holding up. Let me say it that way. So can we take out some of these top side targets? And again, will not farm payrolls really drive dollar strength right, ahead of the Fed rate decision next week? So those are some of the themes that I'm watching. Um, and again, with the ECB on tap tomorrow, we'll see how the DAX will play out. We'll see how the Euro will certainly play out here. But right now, Euro, I'm waiting for clarity. I think we're just really stubbornly stuck somewhat in the middle of this range. Yeah, a little bit lower, but... In larger cab by 106.60, 106.80, we'll see if that 104.70, 105.00 region will continue to offer some support, right? But Euro, uh, let me say this, the European block uh, as a whole, I would say, very unattractive for me, more so about, you know, commodity block and, you know, with the spill that we're seeing in Aussie making fresh monthly lows here, will these be some more of the uh, better attractive pairs to watch where we could see some nice moves, some nice levels come back into play, right? Hope you guys enjoy the analysis, and tomorrow... Um, I am supposed to cover uh, import price next tomorrow morning, but you know what? Drahi is supposed to speak around that hour, so I'll try to cover some of his comments. We'll look at the market reaction, and then maybe we'll do like a little bit of a preview for non farm payrolls as well. Um, and, I'll, and I'll look at some trade steps that we can prepare, especially ahead of Fed, BOJ, Dutch elections. Let's, let's throw that in there, right? All for next week. Right? But with that out of the way, guys. I'm over on time, so I hope you guys enjoyed the analysis again. Have a great day, and I hope to see you all again tomorrow morning to again, not only cover the import price index out of the U.S., but you know, also dig into some of the commentary or the press conference that we'll get with ECB President Mario Jari. But until then, the best of luck on all your trades, guys.